So today we are talking about environmental aspects of globalization. Um, I'll talk about the handout I gave folks a little bit later in class. Just wanted to give you a little bit of context of um, what some of these issues look like on a local level at Denison and how Denison is thinking about um, some of these uh, various challenges, both at a global level um, and at sort of a bigger international level. Um, and at the, towards the end of class today, um, I'll also spend a few minutes giving folks, I decided rather than doing a video of what I'm looking for in the news presentations, I would just do a mock presentation so see what it actually looks like and have an idea of what I'm looking for there. So when we think about sort of globalization and environmental issues um, broadly, there's at least five different ways we could think about those dynamics. Right? How we as individual people connect to a whole range of different environmental issues. We could think about it at the local level, so here on campus, Denison, in Granville, sort of more broadly. We could think about it at the state level in Ohio, national level in terms of the United States and how we address uh, climate issues, and a whole range of environmental um, po politics. And then at the kind of broadest global level, the way that all of these different dynamics we've been talking about play out across borders in relationship to the various political and economic and cultural aspects of globalization that we've been talking about um, over this um, past week. And as our author notes, although there's a lot of different um, factors that go into what we think about and what shapes environmental politics, um, probably two of the most important ones our population, as we talked about earlier um, in class, we've seen a huge explosion of the population of the planet um, since the 1900s, and particularly since the 1950s, sort of post-World War II. And so more people on the planet means more people that need resources, more people eating food, more people taking up space. As we uh, discussed in the first week, right, the expansion of cities. Now more of us live in cities than live in rural or countryside areas than we have ever in human history. And that has put a huge number of pressures on water, on land, on air, um, on all the sort of different resources that we rely on. And that kind of second dynamic, the resource consumption, is driven by not only the expanding population, but also by the different ways that we use resources. Right? And we'll look at this in a minute, the impacts that we have as an individual on a whole broad range of environmental issues look very different depending on which country we're talking about and what sort of consumption level individuals in that country have. And then also importantly, if you remember the article briefly mentioned the role of Pope Francis in 2015 at the UN um, meeting leading up to the Paris Climate Summit and talking about the importance of religious communities and religious faith playing a role in helping to not only address environmental issues but think about how to be more um, ecologically sustainable and sort of responsible. And that was a big part of the Laudato Si encyclical that Pope Francis released in 2015, um, Care for Our common creation. And within that, we can think about how do our own religious traditions and values, how do ethics shape the way we think about the sort of broader natural world? Do we see ourselves as stewards who are here to care for sort of the broader planet, animals that live on it as part of sort of a broader fellowship of living beings? Or do we feel like we've been given a mandate to use whatever we want to the fullest of our capabilities to make us happy? irregardless of the impacts it might have on plants, on animals, on ecosystems. Right? So our religious and ethical values will tell us, or at least can inform, how we think about those kind of questions. So, as I said, population growth and resource consumption are two of these big drivers of environmental factors, and as our author talked about, there's a number of important sort of events throughout the last sort of 50 years or so, 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, California, which really in some ways helped spark 
the first Earth Day in 1970 that was held and sort of the beginning of what we would think about as modern sort of environmental consciousness and environmental movements. In 1986, um, sort of nuclear disaster at Chernobyl in what's now Ukraine's Soviet Union at that point, and the risks and dangers of nuclear energy, um, which was highlighted not too long ago in 2011 when the Fukushima Daiichi plant um, went into meltdown following a tsunami in Japan. The 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened off U.S. coast in the Gulf of Mexico. And then more recently, right, the wildfires that ravaged much of the Australian continent between 2019 and 2020, and the ongoing wildfires that we've seen here in the United States, particularly in the West, 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, each season seemed to get worse than the last. You can see the Fukushima photo there in the top left, wildfires in California in the far right, and then the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Those are boats trying to put out the oil platform that had caught on fire after the pipe going down into the ocean ruptured and started spewing um, raw oil up into the ocean. So there's a, obviously way more environmental issues than we have time to cover um, in one sort of lecture. We could spend the entire class, all 14, 15 weeks, just talking about um, this sort of range of different environmental problems. But at sort of a broad level, right, climate change is perhaps the one that folks are more familiar with or the one that gets the most attention. And under that sort of broad umbrella of climate change, we have things like rising sea levels, melting ice, which is contributing to those rising sea levels, right, the impacts of ocean acidification as we get more pollutants in the air and the pollution, particularly sodium, chloride and others into the water that raises the pH level, which makes it harder for aquatic life to survive, leads to what we call coral bleaching and the loss of coral reefs because they simply can't create their calcium anymore for their shells. It starts to break down too much. So if you've ever taken a tablespoon of baking soda and put it in a bowl and poured vinegar on it and it bubbles and dissolves, that's exactly what's happening in the ocean at a much bigger scale with that acidic rain coming down into the ocean. And as we just saw there in the last slide, we're seeing you know, more severe fires, hotter summers, wetter, more erratic monsoons in parts of South and East Asia, more floods everywhere. The United States has um, had our own fair share of flooding, even just this past week with the storm that came up the East Coast. And while we can't say climate change is making hurricanes worse or directly causing them, we know that it's setting up the conditions to make them more likely and to be more destructive when they do occur. Another one our authors talked about is the impacts of habitat loss and biodiversity. And we talked a little bit about this earlier this week in relationship to language, right? The loss of language diversity. We think about Biodiversity could mean cultural diversity. It could mean species diversity. And as we clear more areas, there's less room for species to exist. That puts more pressures on them and makes it more difficult for species to survive. As we just uh, heard on the previous slide there, resource consumption and waste are a big part of this story, particularly as populations grow. And so increasing use of energy, food, land, and water We'll look at a minute at one of these examples, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that's a result of um, our increasing use of plastics as consumers. We're also seeing increasing health problems. Right? So there's a lot of research arguing that the increasing prevalence of pandemics from MERS and SARS to what we're seeing now with COVID is in part connected to increasing deforestation, areas where you have disease vectors and sort of pools and bat populations or other species that wouldn't have come into as frequent contact with people. As we clear more forests, as people move further into remote areas, there's more contact between people and animals, and that makes it easier for viruses to jump species, mutate, and continue to spread. And in addition, if you think about something like malaria as one example, there's a certain altitude at which essentially mosquitoes stop going because it gets too cold. So mosquitoes are one of the main carriers of malaria. 
But as temperatures rise, that level becomes a little bit higher. So the mosquitoes migrate a little bit further north, and the range of malaria then further spreads as well. So a lot of different ways we could think about these climate change impacts across um, human experiences. And then finally, we're seeing increasing conflicts related to environmental issues, particularly water and resources. And we're seeing increasing number of migrants leaving their home countries in response to changing environmental factors, whether it's refugees from Syria because of ongoing droughts that led to crop failures, um, increasing migration from parts of Central America where hurricanes, uh, coffee rust blight, and others are impacting local farmers and other communities' abilities to sustain their livelihoods. And so all these factors are playing in different ways into these broader environmental challenges. A key part of how social movements and increasingly governments and particularly kind of people, broader social movements are thinking about these issues is through the lens of environmental justice and how these environmental harms are impacting frontline communities, primarily black and brown communities, not only in the United States, but all over the world. You think about something like sea level rise, communities, and we'll look at this a little bit in Bangladesh and many other areas are right at the borders of the oceans. And as sea levels rise, their ability to live and survive where they have for um, thousands of years is increasingly um, no longer tenable. And so coming out of the sort of civil rights movement of the 60s and the environmental movement of the 70s, by the early 1980s, we get the emergence of what we think of today as environmental justice movements. Right? So thinking about how do race and class and pollution intersect in different ways and how do we make sense of those challenges and how do we address the inequalities that come from political decisions about, for example, where do we put a landfill or where do we dispose of nuclear waste after it's been used in a plant or how do we think about the legacy of coal mining in Appalachia and how that's impacted different communities. Right? So there's a lot of different ways questions of the environment and justice have been at the forefront of thinking about environmental questions today. One of the ways we can think about all of these different sort of issues that we were looking at is through this idea of the Anthropocene, which in sort of a nutshell is a term that was coined by two scientists in 2000 to think about how to make sense of the increasing impacts of human activities all over the planet. So essentially, how do we think about human impacts at a planetary or a global scale? Because prior to the 2000s, we had still very much thought about environmental issues at a sort of national or perhaps international level, but not at a fully sort of planetary level. And so scholars that were thinking about how do we make sense of humans are now making changes to the planet that in many ways seem like things that took millions of years and long, slow geologic processes in the past, and now they're happening very, very rapidly. How do we make sense of that? And the term they came up with to try to capture this idea is the Anthropocene, or sort of a new human-dominated um, era, from anthropo, meaning human, and scene, meaning sort of new. Um, so we're in a new human era. So we talked a little bit about sort of the interrelationship between environmental and, I'm sorry, political um, and economic globalization already. One of the ways that these dynamics have played out in terms of the environment and global governance are some of these big international frameworks. So we have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, which came out of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, kind of one of the first big important global environmental summits. And out of that came uh, a number of different sort of policies and practices around environmental issues, but one of the most important ones was the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. So if you've heard about the climate summits that are taking place and the kind of research and reports that come out every few years from thousands of scientists all working together to analyze the latest environmental science data, the latest climate data, the latest social and political data related to the environment, um, that work is all happening under the umbrella of the IPCC as sort of a global governing scientific body. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted. Coming out of this UNFCCC sort of 
network of governments and finally went into effect in 2005 once enough countries had signed on to it. So it was put into place in 97, but it took until 2005 to get enough countries to sign on before it became a binding international agreement. And that was really sort of the first big global effort to address environmental issues that we'd seen. In more recently, 2005 Paris Agreement, many of you may have heard about this, was adopted to try to figure out how do we keep our production of CO2, carbon dioxide, down, and in particular, how do we keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels. And that was seen as kind of a benchmark. Once we get above 1.5 degrees Celsius, things start to get a lot murkier in terms of our understanding of how things at a planetary level in the Earth systems um, could be disrupted and go over what scientists refer to as tipping points. So as I mentioned, at that moment, you had Pope Francis making this kind of call to religious communities to do more to think about their role in environmental issues. We often refer to this as the greening of religion. Um, unfortunately, in 2007, under the Trump presidency, the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement. Basically, the argument was this is bad for U.S. businesses, this is bad for U.S. domestic energy um, and other producers, and instead, um, the Trump administration was promoting what they called sort of the America First Energy Plan, which was um, more coal production, more oil and gas um, from within the United States, and also connections with Canada, things like the tar sands oil there. Um, which ships a lot down to the United States, to the Midwest. Um, following the election of President Biden, the United States rejoined the, the Paris Agreement in 2020. And the goal continues to be to try to stop that 1.5 degrees Celsius rise um, by 2050, 2030, if possible. Right? Sooner um, is better. Scientists are worried that after this decade is over, some changes will be much harder to reverse if we don't take sort of immediate steps to draw down the amount of carbon being put into the atmosphere. And more worryingly is looking at the most recent reports that came out from IPCC and these different governmental bodies, is that if we sort of continue with business as usual practices at a global level, and there's a good chance we could see a rise of up to three degrees Celsius by the end of this century, so by 2100. And that would have um, significant ramifications on um, pretty much every environmental question that we can think about. Um, just this past fall, the most recent COP26, or the Conference of Parties, and these are all the members that are part of the UNFCCC framework, came together in Glasgow in the United Kingdom to try to figure out how do we move this process forward from 2015 with the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, no uh, legally binding Agreements came out of that meeting. There was a lot of talk, but not a lot of um, concrete political steps. The major things that did come out was countries committing to reduce the methane, methane production, particularly associated with natural gas, as there's been a greater push to use natural gas instead of coal. There's also been an increasing worry about rising methane, um, trying to reduce deforestation, trying to cut financing to coal, particularly the opening of new coal plants. And part of the argument was we can't bring our levels of CO2 down if we keep creating new um, energy plants using coal, which is the dirtiest form of energy in terms of putting out CO2 into the atmosphere. And then finally, sort of attempts to finalize some of the international rules and frameworks for carbon credits and carbon trading to create international carbon markets to try to help drive down use of carbon as well. So just to give you a little sense of why these issues matter, so this is CO2 per capita or per person, looking back from 1790, so kind of very beginning stages of the Industrial Revolution, going up to today, and then broken out by a number of different countries. And as you can see there, the level has been slowly increasing, but a particular note here, so 1850, we're sort of fully getting into the Industrial Revolution. 1900, we're starting to see more of an uptick, but it's really at this period, sort of after about 1950, where we see an like, explosion, and if we had all the countries on the planet here, you would see that um, spike even more drastically. And it's precisely the increasing population numbers and increasing resource use 
um, that's driving this spike in CO2 production. Um, but as you can see there, certain countries play a much greater role in terms of how much an individual contributes um, to this overall picture. And if we separate out that data just a little bit, you can see this bottom line. So the average person across the entire world contributes just about five tons per year of CO2. But if you're in Australia, here in the United States, or Canada, as an individual, you're contributing three times as much as someone in another country. So part of that earlier question about how much we're playing a role in these depends on where you live and your sort of lifestyle and resource consumption habits. So you can imagine if everyone in the world consumed at the level of Australians or Canadians or Americans, that level of carbon would be much higher. And as we're seeing increasing industrialization, rising middle classes, um, more desire for consumer goods around the world, the, that's the kind of the pressure. How do we bring down carbon levels while increasing people's livelihoods and kind of general um, well-being? If we look at this just from sort of 1980 to today, you can see parts per million is sort of the way that scientists measure how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, and we're on, unfortunately, a steady and consistent upward trend and have been um, since the Industrial Revolution, but since 1980, as this chart here shows. How many folks have heard about the Impossible Burger or these other various alternative meats? Right, so environmental concerns are driving some of the efforts to try to think about how do we reduce meat consumption, not just in the United States, but all over the world? And there's a direct correlation as people become more financially well off, they tend to consume more meat. And so as the world is getting slightly wealthier a little bit every generation, meat consumption habits are going up. So people are looking at, well, how do we reduce those impacts of the amount of land, the amount of food, the amount of energy, the amount of water that go into that sort of story and things like meat substitutes, fake meats, alternative meats, the Impossible Burger um, is kind of one part of that story where we're seeing science and technology trying to respond to sort of consumer demands and broader sort of environmental issues. And in the process, hopefully give you a hamburger that tastes just as good, but without as much of the environmental impact, right? That's the idea, at least. Part of the reason this matters is because all of these different consumer habits play into our overall sort of carbon footprint. So as you can see, the chart here on the left, the sort of width, so how wide from this way to this way, corresponds to how many people, sort of the overall population, and then how far that sort of comes out is representative of how much of a CO2 impact they have. So you can see some countries a very small population, but a very large CO2 impact. And that's similar to the church we saw earlier. And just, you know, for an example, we talked about, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and other sort of cultural foods earlier this week. You know, to make a quarter pounder, you need a lot of resources, fuel, land, water, food, transportation. A lot goes into just making that one quarter pound of beef. And so those sort of environmental impacts are one of the reasons that Companies are looking at things like these impossible burgers um, and other sort of lower impact um, foods. Now, here's one of the interesting but also sort of frustrating things about these challenges. So Lawrence Liverpool National Laboratories is one of sort of the major scientific institutes in the U.S. that looks at sort of overall energy issues. You can see here from 2020, our most recent report, all the different types of energy that are in the United States right now and how much we're using from all of those and sort of where they're going. So some of them going into industrial uses, some of those going into transportation, right? So a lot of that transportation is the fuel for vehicles. But one important thing you can see here, so 30% or 30.6% of all that is going into energy services, so residential, commercial, transportation, sort of all those impacts. 63% is what's called rejected energy. This is basically energy that is produced but doesn't ever get captured or used. So if you've ever driven by a power plant and seen the big sort of coal stacks or the big power stacks with steam vapors coming off, that's all wasted energy. So 
more than two-thirds of all the energy we're producing, we're actually losing it in the process between when it's generated and where it actually goes to its final sort of use. So part of the challenge for uh, scientists and others is figuring out how do we make things more energy efficient. Right? You think about the change from incandescent bulbs a century ago to LEDs today as a way to increase the amount of energy that you're getting out of something, but using much less of it in the process. And so these are the kind of environmental challenges that are you know, fueling sort of your generation and the current generation of scientists to think about, you know, we have two challenges, right? One is the environmental impact, but the other is how do we stop wasting 60% of all the energy we're generating and capture more of that and then put that back in the process? Because if we could actually harness that energy, then we wouldn't need to be generating as much because we wouldn't be losing as much in the process. So I want to drill down a little bit deeper into what are the potential implications of this three degrees Celsius rise and what that might look like at a sort of global level. So a dire situation, as they point out, and one that also has a lot of uncertainties to it. There's just a lot of things that after you hit about 2 or 2.5 degrees Celsius, we simply don't know yet um, how the planet might react because we've never, we have no sort of point of reference the last time. The Earth's been at that kind of a temperature was millions of years ago, long before there were sort of humans on the planet to have to think about that, much less all of the you know, urban industrial technologies that um, this you know, documentary highlighted. Okay, so questions. Okay, so here's um, sort of an example of what I'm looking for um, in the global news reports. I have a five-minute sand timer that I'll put on the table for folks to use. So pretend that I am World News Group 5 looking at North America. Hi, everybody. Thanks. We are World News Group 5 looking at North America. Here's the news from the last two weeks. Um, the Supreme Court blocked President Biden's public vaccine mandate. There was a hostage crisis at the Colville Synagogue in Texas where the assailant was killed. Trump was at a rally where he was repeating um, the election was stolen, that he and others will prove that this is the case. In another story, the Department of Justice charged 19 Oath Keepers with seditious conspiracy for their participation in the January 6, 2001 insurrection. And finally, there is an investigation continuing in Ottawa, Canada, into the Maryville tanker explosion. So we felt like the story about the Supreme Court blocking um, Biden's vaccine mandate was particularly interesting because right? it highlights this tension between, on one hand, we have the government and government health officials telling us one thing and trying to put certain practices into place. But then we have the Supreme Court or other courts um, overruling or throwing out those saying either they don't have the political mandate to do that or they've gone beyond um, their political boundaries. And this raises really interesting question about right, this tension between um, what those in government think is best on any kind of political issue, mandates for vaccines in this case, and all the different kind of political processes that go into impacting um, those kind of decisions. And so it reminded us just how challenging it can be from a sort of government or political level to put some kind of policies into place when you don't have um, all of the different parts of a government, in this case the courts, I'm backing you. So how do you govern when the people making laws and the people evaluating laws, the Supreme Court, don't uh, sort of see eye to eye, and then how that impacts things like public mandates for vaccines. So we think that was an interesting story. The other one is the Oath Keepers. So this is like a paramilitary organization that was charged with seditious conspiracy. And this one is interesting because this is the first time of anyone that's been arrested for January 6th where they're actually being charged with conspiracy. There's been a lot of debate about, you know, was this just people who wandered in? Was this a sort of planned event? Um, what was going on? So the fact that the Department of Justice is actually um, charging some of these individuals, uh, 19 of them, with um, conspiracy and planning um, specifically conspiracies, possibly even involving arms that were going to be brought in across the river, 
um, raises questions about, you know, what was really going on, how much do we know. So those were the two stories that we thought um, were really interesting and we wanted to share with you all. So that's about right, three minutes of a presentation. So if you imagine you talk about your sort of highlight stories, and then if you have two or three people in your group who each want to talk a little bit about one of those points, and so each group has about you know five or six minutes to do that. So that's basically what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, and then I'll basically, so just as a reminder, Thursday night um, post that kind of write-up for your group. If it goes a little bit over one page, that's all right, but try it if you can keep it on one page. And then I'll distribute all those so that everyone's got a copy of all the group's reports, and then we'll actually hear kind of the more details from folks. So.